Threadripper brings AMD closer to where its Ryzen architecting started, with server class Epic chips that later were worked down into consumer lines. And so Threadripper should more fully expose AMD's multi-die architecture and its benefits of performance. The CPUs ship at $800 for the 1920X and $1,000 for the 1950X, both of which are on the bench for review today. And they also both pose a serious threat to Intel's newly launched Skylake X high-end lineup. We're focusing on game streaming, power, thermals, Blender and Premiere performance, and other items along the way with a lower weight splash of gaming, just for perspective. Before getting to that, this video is brought to you by Synergy, the software that lets you share a keyboard and mouse between multiple systems. If you have limited desk space and multiple computers to command, Synergy removes the need for separate peripherals or a KVM and works as over-the-network software. Use our link below to get 50% off the basic or pro version. We have a lot to get through today, so there'll be no fluff at all. You can click the link in the description below for the article if you want background information on Threadripper. But for now, we're just focusing on getting through the benchmarks in the video. Before going through those, a few items of note on Threadripper overall. Overclocking is not going to be the most impressive thing you've ever seen with Threadripper. There are reasons for that. We'll explain those. But in some of the charts, you will see lower performance with the all-core overclock than with the out-of-box performance. The main reason for this is XFR, or extended frequency range, and with Threadripper, AMD has a 200 megahertz XFR over the advertised boost. So if advertised boost is 4.0, it goes up to 4.2, and it can do that on four cores. This means that applications which use fewer cores, like games in a lot of instances, will do better stock because they can use that XFR to boost to 4.2 gigahertz or something like that, plus 200, rather than an all-core boost of 4.0, where half or more of the cores are never even touched to begin with. So if you see results that look higher with the out-of-box config, that's the reason. We're still showing 4.0 gigahertz overclocks in some of the charts, though, just because I'm sure people are curious, but we were not stable all-core over 4.0 without just absurd voltages. So. That's the first note. The next note is there are two memory modes with Threadripper, distributed and local. These are also known as uniform memory access and non-uniform memory access, or UMA and NUMA. Distributed is the default mode and tends to work best for content creation tasks, as UMA isn't restricted to one die and allows the scheduler to do whatever it wants. NUMA tends to be better in some games, but restricts workloads to one die and the memory attached to that die. There are creative applications that minimize thread sharing and synchronization between cores, so they're not that latency intensive, and that's why you would see better performance with the other mode, as opposed to games, which do actually care a lot about latency and synchronization in most cases, because you might be synchronizing things like the physics and game logic threads, or AI threads, or things like that. So NUMA tends to be better in these use cases, we do have tests of these in AB, but they'll be coming out separately. However, we have tested for today the AMD bundled game mode, which disables half of the cores and switches the memory access mode to local. Let's start with streaming benchmarks while gaming. These are two tasks that are intensive and perform simultaneously. So stream, game, video playback from the stream, and then we have other benchmarks that are dual stream or streaming while recording. And the reason that those came out is because the single stream benchmarks while gaming were simply not intensive enough to show any difference whatsoever between Threadripper and the 7900X. They were, it was just too easy for them. And so we started introducing other tests, and one of those was the dual streaming with Dota 2, streaming to Twitch and YouTube simultaneously, like we do with the 7900X review. The other one was streaming CSGO while recording that locally and they were also both really not that intensive when you've got 32 threads to work with, but we'll go through the results anyway. We're focusing on the more intensive tests here since the single stream output tests were just trivial for both CPUs to handle. To be fair, they're also trivial for an R7-1700 to handle as we showed previously, so it doesn't really teach us anything new that we can focus on here. First up is our simultaneous streaming of Dota 2 to YouTube and Twitch, which we ran with the H.264 faster preset, the output is 1080p 60 with YouTube's bitrate at 10 megabits per second and Twitch's bitrate at 4 megabits per second. These outputs cover all of the bases with the most common stream setups when we polled our audience. As seen here, even with this tremendous load on the CPUs, we drop effectively 0% of the frames on all tested devices. 
We'll look at the 1920X in the very near future, though it'd be fair to assume that that would perform about the same given where the 10-core Intel and 16-core AMD parts land, that is to say, probably dropping 0% of frames. As far as the viewer's experience is concerned, both of these CPUs output effectively a perfect 60 FPS to two streaming services simultaneously. You would not be able to tell the difference as a viewer, and that's a good thing. They're both good at this task. Here's a look at the FPS output to the player now that we know what the viewer experience is like. When dual streaming, the 1950X manages 79 FPS average to the player, though it dips down somewhat in frame times toward the 1% and 0.1% slowest frame times. The 7900X performs well ahead here, but we also know that Dota 2 does tend to favor Intel parts. We were previously benchmarking Dirt Rally for this test as well, but unfortunately it doesn't work here because Threadripper just doesn't work with Dirt Rally without disabling half the cores. And that's more on the game development side because Dirt just doesn't know what the hell it's looking at when it sees 32 threads, so it freaks out and crashes. The 7900X is doing well though, but regardless of that, Threadripper is still hanging on and could be tuned for better performance. It is perfectly acceptable here considering that the stream output is delivering 100% of the frames in a game that tends to be against AMD's favor to begin with, so things are looking good to start with for Threadripper. Ultimately, if you wanted extreme frame rates and consistent frame times anyway, it'd probably just be best to build a separate capture box to offload the work. Both still do well here, though the 7900X is outperforming the 1950X in player-side frame rates. We have to give Intel major credit here. Their i9-7900X stock CPU, when streaming, is performing more or less better than AMD's 1950X when it's not streaming, particularly if we're assigning more weight to the lower end frame time performance. So the 7900X is doing very well in this particular benchmark and with both at $1,000, it's probably the better buy if you're playing CSGO specifically, but this is not the complete picture because again, we're testing Dota 2 and CSGO right now, both of which come from the same company and both of which probably show the same favor in terms of optimization. So for a more complete picture, what we'll have to do is revisit this once we get to the 1920X streaming benchmarks and try to add a couple more games. So keep an eye out for that. Strictly with this game, Intel's doing well. Just keep in mind that there is a lot more to the complete picture as we learn more about Threadripper and its advantages. But we'll look at power metrics in a moment to see how that battle shapes up and see if the 1950X can claw back any advantages outside of FPS. During the CSGO recording and streaming test with medium encoding speed, which we had to step down from faster because faster just simply wasn't intensive enough and neither was medium for the record. The i9-7900X was consuming 193 watts at the EPS 12 volt rails when under average peak conditions. The Threadripper 1950X consumed about 134 to 140 watts average peak power. This is a significant reduction from what the 7900X uses. That's a good thing. The 7900X does outperform the 1950X in player side frame rate with this game, but the 1950X outperforms it in power consumption, competing with a 27% reduction over the 7900X with equivalent viewer side output, just the player side that changes. Let's plot temperatures on the right axis now on the same chart. During this synchronized CSGO workload, we see the 7900X ramping up to an average peak core temperature of 62C. The 1950X is around 57C on average. Ambient is accounted for in these measurements as well. It's not a huge difference, particularly when considering that TJ Maxx is different for each CPU but that's what we're looking at for temperatures during these streams. We could do a lot more with this, but most of the, uh, actually all of the other tasks that we ran were just so much lower intensity that it's, they're both good. They both deliver 100% of the frames. There's no point in looking at the data. It would be like, it's just, it's a pointless benchmark. We ran the test anyway, because normally those are actually pretty hard for CPUs to handle. But when you're looking at a 10 core 20 thread part and a 16 core 32 thread part, they're irrelevant. So that's what we have for now. The numbers here indicate that if you wanted to, with Threadripper especially, you could step down from the medium preset that we use to something even slower, which means a higher quality output technically, although you start entering placebo territory, it could handle it, it could keep up uh, if you wanted to do that. But for now we're using medium, it all looks good and the CPUs perform effectively identically on the stream viewer side output. One other item of note here, you can play around a lot with affinities and priorities with streaming. We know this, we've done it a bit in the past. Didn't do it here because it just wasn't necessary. So there's something to be said there. If you would rather not fuss with any of it, 
then certainly one of these two CPUs would be a good solution to that, assuming you don't want a separate box, because now you, just, you never touch the affinities or priorities unless you run into a really odd use case like Dirt Rally or Codemasters games, which just don't work. But that's not a big deal. You turn on game mode in Ryzen Master, and it works fine at that point, though you lose half your cores. But that's a, that's a pretty limited sample size from what we've seen so far, and it should go away in the future. But that's what we're looking at. Uh, if you are okay with playing around with things, then you could buy the cheaper CPUs, assuming this is the only thing you want to do with them anyway. And just while we're here, one quick note on VR. It'll be fine. <laughs> VR works well on the 1700. It works well on the 7700K. They are imperceptibly different, and you won't see any benefit from going to these higher core count parts. Anyway, moving on to power next. This is a good time to segue into those. We're measuring at the EPS 12 volt rail for power consumption. This is not aggregate wall draw like we used to do from the power supply directly to the CPU. We also have high performance mode set for these measurements, so keep that in mind. Idle, the Threadripper CPU, the 1920X and the 1950X, were both consuming about 8.6 watts, which is within measurement error of the R3 and R7 CPUs, accounted for especially by the motherboard change. Overclocking gets us up to 22 watts to 30 watts draw idle when using the high performance power plan. Comparatively, we measured the 7900X at 49 watts idle in the same power plan, though both CPUs can draw less when using a more conservative performance mode. In Blender, the Threadripper CPUs sit within a variance range of one another again, both at around 145 watts on the EPS 12 volt cables. This puts our Threadripper CPUs consuming about 10% more power at stock than the overclocked 1700. The 7900X stock CPU runs the same Blender test at 171 watts, with its overclocked variance at 224. Threadripper remains remarkably efficient in its out-of-box state, but starts guzzling power when overclocked on higher voltages to sustain an all-core OC. We're at 274 watts when overclocked on the 1950X, and 212 on the 1920X. And as you'll see in our benchmarks for Blender, it's not worth it. Total War Warhammer pulls 75 watts when the 1950X is in its stock configuration using creative mode, and 53 when the 1920X is in its stock configuration. Note that these are with auto voltages on the Zenith, the stock 7900X consumes 93 watts for the same task, with overclocking pushing both flagships to 100 watt territory. For Prime 95, Cinebench, Firestrike, and others, check the article linked below. Here's a quick look at thermals over time in a Prime 95 28.5 LFFT torture workload. Note that this chart shows spikes as the test iterates between larger FFT sizes, so you'll see a thermal torture scenario enumerated as power and FFT cycles iterate. The 7900X runs warmest here using our X62 and sits at a delta T over ambient of around 50C peak average. As FFT size progresses, we see that the 1950X begins to heat up more and reach what is more or less a steady state at 44C delta T over ambient. Keep in mind that distance from TJ Maxx is different on AMD and Intel processors, so the significance of this temperature will vary between them. Intel maintains a distance from TJ Maxx of about 25C in this test, we think that AMD's TJ Maxx on Threadripper is about 85 to 90 C, though we haven't been able to confirm this directly. That assumption is based on observations of when Threadripper throttles in one of the tests. If that's the case, assuming a 90 C TJ Maxx at the high end, AMD maintains a distance of about 22 to 25 C also. Not so different in this case. Anyway, more thermal discussion in the article. Getting into production workloads next, we start with our in-house Blender animation for CPU workload benchmarking. The Threadripper CPUs don't even need a highlight. They're all on top, though we'll highlight them anyway. The 1950X completes our render in 15 minutes, a remarkable speed considering we were only recently impressed with the R7 1700's 27.6 minute completion time. This performance places the 1950X ahead of the $1000 7900X CPU when overclocked to 4.5 GHz even. The $800 1920X manages to keep pace with this 7900X line item. Coming in $200 cheaper and about the same rendered performance, it's clear that the 1920X carries the trend of lower SKU AMD CPUs offering the best value. That said, the 1950X does reduce render time by a still noteworthy 19% over the 1920X. It's not a bad price for such a reduction, assuming you're doing something that'll actually leverage it. Otherwise, the 1920X is looking impressive from this testing and serves a good value proposition. Off to a good start on this one. Adobe Premiere is next. This test uses one of GN's own project files as a benchmark for a real workload and positions the 1950X again at the top of the chart. Well, aside from the CUDA accelerated workers, anyway. Premiere still benefits from boosted CPU performance for certain types of renders, 
though it is not the most optimized application you'll ever use. Regardless, the 1950X completes the render in 41 minutes, with the 1920X finishing the render 14% slower at 46.6 minutes. Just behind this is the 7900X CPU at 54 minutes, though its overclocked variant does claw back a good amount of ground. For perspective, the R7 1700X overclocked at 3.9 GHz finishes the render in 62 minutes, showing that the similarly clocked 1920X provides a 25% time reduction from its extra cores. POV Ray multi-threaded rendering is next and posts the 1950X completing the workload in 46 seconds, followed by the 7900X 4.5 GHz OC CPU at 51 seconds. The render time increases 11% here and is followed next by the stock 1920X CPU. For perspective, our highest scoring R7 CPU completes the work in 76 seconds multi-threaded for a render time increase of 64% from the 1950X stock CPU. Here's the single-threaded version of this test. Here, it's clear as day that Intel still holds a significant lead in single-threaded performance. The 7900X is impressive in this regard and completes the one-threaded workload in 565 seconds for a 22% time reduction from the 1950X stock CPU. That's a big jump in Intel's favor and also coincides with Intel's still stronger performance in other single-threaded intensive applications, but that's also not news. Don't buy the Ryzen architecture CPUs if you want the strongest possible single-threaded performance or highest IPC. For most folks in the enthusiast content creation audience, though, thread count holds a lot of relevance, and so Ryzen architecture is completely valid and should be considered in those use cases. Moving on to games briefly here, because it's really not the focus, we're more interested in the game streaming aspect of it. If you skipped the part earlier where we talked about how overclocking and cores impact games, now's a good time to go back and watch that before confusing comments are posted. It's discussed right after the ad spot. We'll walk through a handful of game benchmarks next. Again, as this is an HEDT platform, we're more interested in the X399 configurations from the standpoint of gaming while streaming, but we'll just look at gaming anyway. It's just not weighted as much for HEDT. AMD's Threadripper CPUs benefit in Total War Warhammer from game mode, which requires a reboot and disables half the cores, then switches the memory mode to local from distributed. Stock with the distributed memory mode and 16 cores, the 1950X operates an average of around 127 FPS, with lows at 82 and 42.8. Rebooting with local memory access and half the cores enabled, we operate instead at a significantly boosted 146 FPS average, with lows also significantly boosted to 109.1% and 68 FPS 0.1% lows. That's about a 20 FPS gain for each category. The average FPS bump is about 15% with game mode in this particular title and is well worth it. Here's where it gets interesting. Notice that the all-core 4 GHz overclock, which overrides XFR and other features, is performing noticeably worse than the stock configuration. This is partly because of XFR, which occasionally boosts threads to frequencies between 4.1 and 4.2, AMD has done well with XFR here. That's the story and the takeaway. The range has expanded significantly, now with plus 200 megahertz over boost, and it functions well enough that it'd actually be worse to overclock in some games like this one. As for the 1920X, we're seeing competitive performance the 1950X largely because, just based on thoughts right now, the game doesn't understand what a 16-core CPU is or what to do with it. Comparatively, the 7900X stock CPU operates a 168 FPS average with 70 FPS 0.1% low values, and so is significantly boosted over the 1950X in this particular workload. 1440p won't change the scaling much unless running something very graphics intensive or with a lower end GPU, like, well, lower end relatively, like a 1080 non-DI, but 4K will. 4K will be the great equalizer here. If gaming on higher resolutions, the performance gap somewhat minimizes as it becomes a GPU bottleneck at that point, though games that don't understand the threads will still need gaming mode to resolve frame latency issues even at higher resolutions. As usual though, none of these HEDT CPUs are good value for gaming. You're way better off buying something like an R5 or an i7-7700K for something like this, but those won't handle workstation tasks nearly as well. GTA 5 is our next title and posts an average FPS of 116 for the 1950X stock CPU with 1% lows at 62 and 0.1% calculating out to 32 FPS. These low end frame time performance metrics are pretty damn bad, but that's because the game doesn't know again what to do with the CPU. The frame times are inconsistent enough that we're experiencing visual stuttering to a point where it's really not worth having the extra cores enabled. Fortunately, enabling the gaming mode toggle in Ryzen Master helps resolve this issue. Game mode brings up the worst 0.1% frame times to about 50 FPS, effectively eliminating the stuttering or hitching. The average is roughly the same. The 1920X stock CPU isn't affected in the same way, 
given its lower core count, and so enjoys the benefit of a 50 FPS 0.1% low out of the box, with averages proportionately higher overall. We think part of this is because CPUs with the same core count as the 1920X have already existed, so it's not unreasonable to expect some level of optimization of the code for them. For reference, the 7900X operates at 145 FPS average, and this boosts FPS about 26% over the 1950X stock CPU. Ash's Escalation posts the 1950X at 47 FPS with lows at 33 and 31. This is one of the few tests where we consistently saw higher thread counts utilized, and is also one of the few tests where we see a performance loss by enabling gaming mode. AMD acknowledged this and noted the loss as expected, is simply because Ashes usually uses those threads and distributed memory mode. This positions the 1950X about 4.5% behind the 7900X, not bad given previous results. 1920X isn't far behind and actually does lose to the 1950X in this particular title, unlike some of the others, which is, again, because the extra cores are actually utilized rather than just confusing the game. Metro Last Light's another game where we see the 1920X behind the 1950X and see those cores utilized somewhat, but you can check the article below for that game and others. We have a lot more to do with Threadripper. This is one of the more interesting products we've worked on the last few months. It has a whole lot of options for testing and for use cases as a user. So we'll be iterating on this, especially in the thermal department. But for now, one thing to get out of the way first, like the 7900X, just like we said for the 7900X, actually just like we said for the 1800X, don't buy it for gaming only. If you're only gaming, just, just stop and go buy something that's $250 or something like that, because the, these aren't for you. Um, so that's stated. What these do well on the gaming side are things that uh, would be more enthusiast type tasks, like recording your games while playing them and encoding that on the CPU rather than relying on NV Encoder or something like that, if you prefer not to use Shadow Play with NV Encoder. Other than that, we're looking at benefits primarily in production workloads. Blender is really impressive for Threadripper. It's, it's well ahead. The 1950X actually posts a good gain over the 1920X, so it's not just another pointless step to a processor that is really hard to justify existence of. In this case, the 1950X actually has purpose. It's doing well. It's 20 or so percent ahead of the 1920X, but the 1920X is still really damn good it's $800, which looking at the, this market and the segment is also pretty damn good and very competitive. And that makes these two CPUs some of the more exciting ones that we've looked at recently. In the game streaming side, while they do not offer a noteworthy advantage over the 7900X, at least with the type of streaming we tested, they do offer a good value proposition if you look at the 1920X. And we need to do more with that one on streaming but it's fair to say where it'll fall. That said, subscribe and check it out when we post that information. Strictly from the standpoint of where these CPUs perform best, Blender performance, it's chart topping. Premiere performance, aside from CUDA acceleration, it's chart topping, and you can still use that. We finally found some applications uh, that will use the extra cores without just CUDA accelerating beyond the, the usefulness of those extra cores. And then uh, for other things like streaming, it's good, it's just not and it's not special, but it's good. And not special strictly because the 7900X also is fine for those applications because turns out streaming while gaming, although intensive, is still not enough for these CPUs to really start crumbling. You need to do other stuff in the background. Maybe if you did streaming while gaming while rendering something in Blender, then you'd start to see differences. We also start departing from real world use cases at that point. But if that's you, Threadripper looks good for it. We didn't talk about gaming performance too much in this video. It wasn't really the focus. We were more interested in streaming while gaming or productivity. But here's the thing. If you are doing a lot of gaming, it is your primary task. Be careful because it may be the case that something like an R7 1700 or an overclocked variant is a better buy for you because this CPU, the 1950X, the 1920X, they do have problems with games. It may be the case that the games don't launch. A lot of the ones we've tested, we just see lower performance scaling overall than with Ryzen 7, for example, because the games don't understand what they're looking at, and something like Ryzen 7 is just more acceptable to them, things are built for them a little bit better. So be aware of that. That's not to say that this CPU is bad in any way, it's just that if you are doing something like, for example, streaming to a single service, so it's a low workload stream relatively, if you're streaming to one service, and you're playing games, 
Ryzen 7 is going to be a better buy for you. If you're streaming to multiple services, capturing live, or using the more intensive encoding options, then Threadripper should be a bigger consideration. But until that point, Ryzen 7 makes more sense unless you're doing other things like Blender or Premiere work or any kind of CPU crunch where the CPU will be pegged to 100%. Those are the cases where Threadripper makes sense. But if you are primarily a gamer, even one who streams, just go to the article linked below, look at the gaming results, and consider that maybe a Ryzen 7 CPU would be a better buy for you because the performance can actually be superior due to the optimizations and other issues with Threadripper's unique features that make it so good at production. So all that said, the 7900X is still a good CPU. Uh, it's gotten a bad rap because X299 was frankly rushed. Intel pulled in launch quite a lot and that hurt their launch. It's still a good CPU and it's just being challenged now. So Threadripper is a good launch. We can give to AMD that they really ironed out the difficulties with Ryzen. When Ryzen launched, it was a complete mess behind the scenes leading up to the review. The communication internally at AMD was bad. The communication with vendors from what we heard was bad. And the motherboard support at launch was mixed. Now, with that several months behind us, they've worked to really fix all of that. So Threadripper has rolled in all of these fixes and all these really painful learning points for AMD into a platform that finally is actually pretty stable. So we obviously haven't tested everything possible for Threadripper, but from what we've tested with this platform and the CPUs we have, we really didn't run into any stability issues that would cause me to say, I'm afraid of using this in a real environment. Whereas previously, it was like, okay, these, these are kind of pretty good in some use cases, but the memory concerns are a little worrying, the crashing or whatever is a little worrying, things like that. They've all been pretty much ironed out now, as you've seen in our coverage for the last few months. So Threadripper, we can handily give the winning award, I suppose, over the 7900X in a lot of those applications, and it's a good buy. That said, not everyone should buy it. Just remember like what you're doing with the PC and uh, buy something appropriate for that. The R5 1600X is good in the cheaper end. The i7 7700K is good in the higher end of gaming. Otherwise, look into this one. Thank you for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus to help us out directly. Click the link below for the article or go to GamersNexus.squarespace.com to pick up a shirt like this one. As always, I'll see you all next time.